Honorable Chief Justice, Justices of Appeal, Judges and Masters of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. Their Excellencies, the Governor, Governors General, and Their Excellencies, the Heads of State of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Honorable Heads of Government of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Retired Judges of each of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. Honorable Attorneys General of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Honorable Ministers of Government of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Chief and Senior Magistrates and Magistrates of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Honorable Speakers of the Houses of Assembly and Presidents of the Senate of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Honorable Leaders of the Opposition of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Members of Parliament of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Dr. Didicus Jules, Director General of the OECS Commission. Directors of Public Prosecutions of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Solicitors General of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Mrs. Michelle John Thibbles, Chief Registrar, and Mr. Carlos Cameron Michel, Deputy Chief Registrar of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. Registrars and Deputy and Assistant Registrars of the High Court of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Mr. Gregory Girard, Court Administrator of the Court's Headquarters, and Mr. Francis Letin, Deputy Court Administrator of the Court's Headquarters, and Court Administrators of each of the OECS High Court Officers in all of the Member States and Territories. Ms. Jean Dyer, President of the OECS Bar Association. Presidents of the Constituent Bar Associations of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Learned members of the Inner and Utter Bar of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Members of the Clergy. Members of the Diplomatic Corps. Commissioners of Police of each of the OECS Member States and Territories. And Police Officers in each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Directors and Heads of Correctional Facilities in each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Staff of the Court's Headquarters and Court Offices in each of the OECS Member States and Territories. Students, Citizens and Residents of the Eastern Caribbean. Good morning. Welcome to this ceremony marking the opening of the law year for 2021. It is a virtual opening this year, coming to you from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, where the opening would have been held in normal circumstances. But these are not normal circumstances. Still, with the assistance of the technology and the guidance of the Honorable Chief Justice, we will have today's opening. We will soldier on. I know that you've all been inspired and refreshed from the words that we heard in the addresses and the sermons in the court services that marked the opening of the lawyer here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. With the assistance and the guidance of the Most High, it is hoped that we will be able to make it through this law year and achieve the things that we set out to do. This morning, we will be hearing addresses. The first address will come to you from a speaker who really needs no introduction. She's our very own Dame Janice M. Pereira, DBE, LLD. Dame Janice Pereira was sworn in as the first female Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court on the 24th of October, 2012. She joined the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court as a High Court judge in 2003. She served in the territories of Anguilla and Montserrat. She was later elevated to the position of Justice of Appeal in 2009. In May 2013, she was awarded Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. In March 2018, she was called to the bench as an honorary bencher of the Honorable Society of the Middle Temple. 
The award of Honorary Doctorate of Laws was bestowed upon Dame Janice by the University of the West Indies in 2018. One year later, Dame Janice was elected an Honorary Master of the Bench of the Honorable Society of Gray's Inn. So to present our feature address this morning, our very own Chief Justice, Dame Janice M. Pereira. Justices of Appeal, Judges and Masters of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, their Excellencies, Governors General and Heads of State of each of the OECS member states and territories, Honorable Heads of Government of each of the OECS member states and territories, Retired Judges of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, Honorable Attorneys General of each of the OECS member states and territories, Honorable Ministers of Government of each of the OECS member states and territories, Chief and the Senior Magistrates and Magistrates of each of the OECS member states and territories, Honorable Speakers of the Houses of Assembly and Presidents of the Senate of each of the OECS member states and territories. Honorable leaders of the opposition of each of the OECS member states and territories. Members of parliament of each of the OECS member states and territories. Dr. Didicus Jules, Director General of the OECS Commission. Directors of public prosecutions of each of the OECS member states and territories. Solicitors General of each of the OECS member states and territories. Mrs. Michelle John Thibbles, Chief Registrar, and Mr. Carlos Cameron Michelle, Deputy Chief Registrar of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. Registrars and Deputy Assistant Registrars of the High Court of each of the OECS member states and territories. Mr. Gregory Girard, Court Administrator of the Court's Headquarters, and Mr. Francis Litang, Deputy Court Administrator of the Court's Headquarters, and Court Administrators of each of the High Court Offices of the OECS Member States and Territories. Ms. Jean Dyer, President of the OECS Bar Association, Presidents of the Constituent Bar Associations, of each of the OECS member states and territories. Learned members of the inner bar and outer bar of the each of the OECS member states and territories. Members of the clergy, members of the diplomatic corps, commissioners of police and police officers of each of the OECS member states and territories. Directors, heads of correctional facilities, in each of the OECS member states and territories, staff of the court's headquarters and court offices in each of the OECS member states and territories, students, citizens and residents of the Eastern Caribbean. Good morning. It is my great honor and pleasure to once again address you as your Chief Justice on the occasion of the official opening of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court's Law Year 2021. Allow me to echo the sentiments of our Master of Ceremonies, Justice Cottle, and to welcome you all to this special sitting and to also extend best wishes to each and every one of you for a year filled with promise, hope, health and happiness. At this time last year, we were embracing the commencement of a new decade, but a seismic upheaval of all things we considered normal, brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic, has had the feel and effect of having lived through a decade in one year. The year 2020, will reverberate in the annals of history 
as the year of unimaginable disruptions, unplanned adjustments and uncertainties all brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Here we are today with the assistance of UWI-TV marking the opening of the law year by means of a virtual special sitting which is being streamed via online social media platforms across the court's nine member states and territories and indeed across the world. Traditionally, each member state and territory would host their own special sitting after the delivery of the Chief Justice's address with local gatherings in a courtroom in each state or territory. However, since the coronavirus makes it unsafe to physically gather, we had to reimagine how we would execute the commemoration of our new law year. We chose the next best option, gathering virtually, which has in fact provided us with this unique opportunity to join with our brothers and sisters from across our member states and territories in a single virtual space, reflective indeed of our court's single judicial space. As many of you are aware, but for the COVID-19 pandemic, this special sitting of the court would have been taking place in the beautiful archipelago of St. Vincent and the Grenadines also known as the gem of the Antilles. I was looking forward with great anticipation to returning to St. Vincent and the Grenadines for this occasion, as it was there that I delivered my first address as Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court a little over eight years ago. I never would have imagined then that I would be unable to return for that purpose because of a pandemic. Just a few years ago, we were managing a different crisis, the crisis brought on by Hurricanes Irma and Maria, which devastated the territory of the Virgin Islands, Anguilla, Antigua and Barbuda, and the Commonwealth of Dominica in 2017. Arguably, we are now operating under a greater degree of uncertainty. With a hurricane, one can, with a reasonable degree of, uncert of certainty, expect when and where it will make landfall, implement measures to minimize its impact on daily life, and estimate the time frame for the return to some level of normalcy. The COVID-19 pandemic, on the other hand, has been much like an unpredictable global earthquake, which has turned our notions of normalcy and reality upside down with universal, far-reaching social and economic consequences. It has no respect for a person's place or status. It has impacted every aspect of our lives, our livelihoods, our social interactions, it has forced us to accelerate our lives in a digital world. This pandemic required the court, much like many other institutions, to find its way through the maze as the new reality set in. The essential challenge for the court was, how do you provide and ensure access to justice and delivery of justice in this new and in many respects unfamiliar environment. We had to wrap our minds around adapting and doing so rapidly. Thankfully, we had already embarked upon our ICT transformation program, albeit at a slower pace. Now it called for ramping it up as well as finding new and innovative solutions to weather this crisis. Therefore, in addition to implementing new measures to ensure the continuity of the work of the court 
and the dispensation of justice in the COVID-19 era, the court has also continued to engage in a series of reforms of existing processes and procedures, all aimed at improving the court's efficiencies and effectiveness in the delivery of justice to the people of the Eastern Caribbean, despite the prevailing circumstances. Through these efforts, the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court has demonstrated what a truly resilient and progressive court it has become over the past 50 years. In line with the court's efforts over the last year, it was felt that a fitting theme for this law year address is the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court managing the COVID quake. The theme reflects the court's resilience in the face of an unfamiliar world. Author Geva Tully once said, persistence and resilience only come from having been given the chance to work through difficult problems. It is essential that the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court remains committed to working through any challenge by being a court that is not only responsive to the changes and needs which are taking place in society, but also adaptable to those changes and needs by devising mechanisms and measures for addressing them if this institution is to remain effective in maintaining the confidence of the people it serves as the guardian of the rule of law. While the buzzword in the management of COVID is quarantine, as judicial officers at whatever level, the realization quickly penetrates our consciousness that justice cannot be quarantined. Crises do not suspend or end conflicts. They simply give rise to new ones. In advancing our commitment to the improvement of the administration of justice and our quest to build resilience for coping with life-changing events, it is first necessary to take stock of where we are now by providing you with an update on the work of the ECSC over the last year and the direction being pursued for the future. I wish to begin by highlighting the volume of work covered by the court on a yearly basis. In what has become the norm, the court dealt with an extremely heavy caseload. At the Court of Appeal, there were 481 appeals filed in 2019. The court heard 393 appeal matters in full court sittings and a further 456 matters in chamber hearings. The Court of Appeal delivered 55 written judgments and 348 oral decisions, amounting to 403 decisions delivered in total. This is by no means insignificant, given the relatively small size of our appellate bench. Fortunately, in June 2020, we were able to increase our complement to seven. At the high court level throughout the court's jurisdiction, a total of 7,450 cases were filed and 4,384 were disposed. Antigua and Barbuda and St. Lucia remain the states with the highest caseload by number. The clearance rates from the high courts varied between 91% in St. Lucia and 30% in Grenada. None of the high courts recorded a clearance rate above 100%. This points to an accumulation of case backlog. Furthermore, on average, 
the overall clearance rate of member states and territories as a grouping continuously declined over the last three years and was at its lowest at 59% in 2019. This flags a dire need for continued and more robust measures to be implemented in those member states and territories which are falling behind. It requires an all hands on deck approach by all stakeholders to arrest and reverse this trend. The factors impacting this trend are many, but in large measure reflects the persistent shortcomings of physical, human, and financial resources at their core. A comprehensive report on the workings of the court can be found in our annual report, which will be available on the court's website. Unfortunately, over the last year, the COVID-19 pandemic significantly hampered the court's ability to effectively manage its caseload and has laid bare the weaknesses and challenges faced in an already under-resourced environment. In several of our member states and territories, the pandemic grounded the conduct of jury trials due mostly to our inability to provide the required proper physical distancing protocols in many of our existing courtrooms. The simple truth is that many of our courtrooms are too small and in some cases not enough. In the COVID-19 environment, it is impossible to have jurors sit elbow to elbow. The question then becomes, what is the solution to this dilemma? In my view, the time is ripe for all governments in consultation with civil society to engage in discussions on the implementation of judge alone criminal trials for specific case types within the context and framework of the constitutional mandate of fair trials within a reasonable time. Judge alone trials are not new in our region. This move has enjoyed much success in reducing the case backlogs in the neighboring state of Trinidad and Tobago, as well as in Belize. It is also being practiced in the Cayman Islands and the Turks and Caicos Islands. I have no doubt that in this COVID climate in particular, the implementation of judge alone criminal trials would go a long way in reducing the backlog of criminal cases in the Eastern Caribbean with no impact whatsoever on the fairness of such trials. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced the court to deepen its reliance on information and communications technology tools in order to optimize efficiency of operations. Because we were already engaged in ICG transformation, much of the court's operations on the civil and commercial side saw less disruption with a smoother transition to the use of electronic communication, including video conferencing, using a variety of virtual platforms, such as Zoom, for conducting remote hearings from any suitable location. Efforts have also been made in some member states and territories to conduct jury trials by a blended approach of partly in-person and partly virtual hearings using integrated digital technology. As for the Court of Appeal, since the onset of the pandemic, all scheduled sittings have been conducted virtually, with only one sitting being missed in mid-March 
for the entire 2020 year. This brings me to the court's e-litigation portal. As many of you know, the e-litigation portal is a platform providing for the electronic filing of court documents, and it facilitates electronic service, case management, and document workflow. The electronic linking of the courts across the nine member states and territories is not some fanciful or obtuse idea. It was vital for the effective operations of the court if improved access to justice for the citizens of the Eastern Caribbean is to be fully realized in the face of our vulnerabilities to natural disasters and now a pandemic. The e-litigation portal is now in place in six of our nine member states and territories. It has made a positive difference in so many ways. The ease of filing, the ease of serving, the ease of paying, and the ease of accessing and managing electronic documents from anywhere, despite natural disasters and despite the current pandemic, since it requires no social distancing or health protocols in order to make use of it. Of importance also are the cost savings to the court and other stakeholders alike. It is the use of this system where it is in place that has enabled the Court of Appeal and other courts to continue to deliver on its work in a timely fashion. Plans are already in progress to link the remaining three member states. Achieving full implementation was slowed due to COVID-19 and the resultant travel restrictions. It is my hope that by July this year, all our member states and territories will be linked to the e-litigation portal. I know that legal practitioners in the remaining states of the Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines are anxiously awaiting this step. It is fair to say that the e-litigation portal has demonstrated in this COVID-19 era, the critical role it plays in keeping the operations of the court in motion. In those member states not yet linked to the portal, we made provisions for email filings and service by email. This was achieved by the passing of emergency practice directions, a practice guide, and the adoption of remote hearing protocols, all of which are still in effect. These have ensured a measure of continuity of the court's operations, even as various levels of lockdown were in place. Indeed, there is no doubt that ICT-driven courts are here to stay. COVID-19 has catapulted us here sooner rather than we had anticipated. I therefore encourage legal practitioners in all our member states and territories to become fully ICT proficient to avoid the risk of being left behind. I extend my appreciation to the team from the court's headquarters and the registrars and staff of the various high court offices for their hard work in facilitating continued ICT training of judicial officers, legal practitioners, and court staff alike, as well as harnessing our ICT resources to keep the wheels of justice turning. Although last year, the court had to shift much of its focus towards implementing measures to mitigate against the effects of the pandemic on the justice system, this did not stop the court from continuing reform initiatives 
which were already in motion, including the work of a number of the court's review committees. These committees met virtually over the last year, evincing great dedication to achieving their objectives. I wish to briefly share with you the fruits of their labor. The Civil Procedure Rules 2000 Review Committee. In last year's address, I announced the formation of a Civil Procedure Rules Review Committee. Today, I am pleased to announce that the Rules Review Committee, co-chaired by Justice of Appeal Paul Webster and Justice Eddie Ventos, former resident High Court Judge of St. Kitts and Nevis, have submitted their report and proposed amendments to the Civil Procedure Rules 2000 are at the drafting stage with the help of Impact Justice Project. We are grateful to the committee for their dedication and hard work. After another round of post-drafting consultations, we are hoping that the amendments will come into effect later this year. The Code of Ethics Review Committee. Also in my last address to you, I announced the formation of an Ethics Review Committee to overhaul and modernize the Court's Code of Judicial Conduct, which was introduced more than 15 years ago. This committee, chaired by Justice Kimberly Snack Fulgens, a resident High Court judge in the member state of St. Lucia, also carried out extensive work and has produced a comprehensive draft revised code which went out to consultation amongst judicial officers, including magistrates and registrars. I express my deep appreciation to the chair and the members of the committee for undertaking this comprehensive review. It is my hope that the new code of ethics will come into effect later this year. The Sentencing Guidelines Project. The Sentencing Advisory Committee, co-chaired by Justice of Appeal, Gerthel Thom, and Justice Ian Morley, a resident High Court Judge of Antigua and Barbuda and Montserrat, has also continued apace with its work. We have now rolled out the first and second tranches of sentencing guidelines. They now cover some drugs offenses, sexual offenses, dishonesty offenses, and firearm offenses with more in the pipeline. Additionally, the court issued a practice direction on sentencing for the offense of murder. This practice direction sets out the approach to be taken by a judge in each member state and territory when sentencing for the offense of murder and highlights the factors which should be considered by a judge during the sentencing process. What gives me and of course the committee a great sense of achievement since the publishing of the first tranche of sentencing guidelines is the buy-in by legal practitioners and judicial officers as evidenced by their use and more so by legal practitioners who have been invoking them even in matters predating their implementation. I place on record my sincere appreciation for the hard and challenging work being done by this committee. I am also grateful for the judicial research support given by two of our judicial research assistants, Mr. Jordan Jarrett and Ms. Leonard Headley, for giving of their time and energy to assist the committee with relevant research. We are also indebted to Ms. Sarah Abraham for the assistance provided in her capacity as criminal justice advisor to the Eastern Caribbean and for her continued interest in seeing the project through 
these formative stages. The family proceedings rules. I am also delighted to report that the family proceedings rules committee has completed their work on drafting rules to guide the procedure in family proceedings. This task has been underway now for quite some time, and it was important that it be finalized so that the long promised family division pilot project earmarked for Antigua and Barbuda can come fully on stream. I express my sincere appreciation to the chair of the committee, Justice Marissa Robertson, High Court Judge resident in Antigua and Barbuda, and the committee members for undertaking this significant task. I also wish to thank Mr. Ian McIntyre, the consultant who assisted with completing the rules and UNICEF for the financial assistance which they provided for this initiative. Court Connected Mediation. Starting in 2019, the court began its efforts to jumpstart court connected mediation in its member states and territories with its court connected mediation public education 2019 and beyond program involving public outreach and mediation training. Over the last year, the court made many strides in these efforts and took a focused approach in reforming and promoting court-connected mediation. The ability to use mediation as an alternative dispute resolution tool during the COVID-19 era took on even greater significance. After much work and a wide consultation process, we were able to issue a very comprehensive and revamped mediation practice direction in October 2020, replacing our 17 year old mediation practice direction. These revisions facilitate improved access to justice, particularly for unrepresented parties and litigants. Some noteworthy revisions include the introduction of pre-action mediations, the expanded role of the Registrar of the High Court in referring matters to mediation, and the introduction of more user-friendly forms. It has also been tightened by the inclusion of a code of ethics and disciplinary regulations for mediators. Importantly, the issued practice direction provides for the conduct of mediation sessions remotely using a digital platform. This development will no doubt provide significant assistance to the court in reducing the buildup of case backlogs during the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, mediation training as well as public education on the availability and benefits of mediation is ongoing. Our ultimate goal is to have a regional roster of mediators, which will provide litigants with a greater range and diversity of choices in selecting a mediator. This adds a new dimension, now more feasible by the use of a virtual platform. The pandemic has brought about some positive results by forcing us to see and engage in the virtual world in ways that have become our new normal, unconstrained by our physical borders. Finally, I once more urge legal practitioners to embrace mediation and be guided by the practice direction. Think of it not as a tool which conflicts with your role, but instead as one which enhances the delivery of justice. I now turn to the Halls of Justice project. There can never be any doubt that our judiciary must always play 
an integral role in ensuring a stable and progressive Caribbean society. Or, as some of our eminent Caribbean leaders would say, promoting our Caribbean civilization. A well-functioning and efficient judiciary is a key component for investor confidence needed for fueling economic growth. The people of the OECS deserve a modern and efficient judiciary, serving them in facilities fit for purpose. ICT can only go so far and new wine does not always blend adequately in old wine skins. For the past eight years, I, as well as Chief Justices before me, have been beseeching governments to address the dire need for proper court facilities. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed how ill-suited most courtrooms across our member states and territories are. COVID should not have met us still in this state. While the court is empathetic towards the ongoing economic challenges in our region occasioned by the pandemic, I wish to remind governments of their constitutional duty to ensure that the rights afforded to their citizens thereunder allow for their meaningful engagement and effective enjoyment. It is my fervent hope that once we have gotten past the pandemic and our economic health has improved, all steps will be taken to address this long outstanding problem. Notwithstanding that we have sought to manage the impact of COVID-19 by doing what we can to minimize its effect on access to justice and justice delivery. There is an area of grave concern emanating from certain quarters outside of the judiciary. I would be remiss were I not to raise them. Over this last year, we witnessed unwarranted and vitriolic attacks on the judiciary as an institution and on judges as individuals by members of the public. The frequency of these attacks is becoming alarming with the potential for causing grave harm to the safeguards which are entrenched in our constitutions for preserving and upholding the rule of law. On too many occasions over the past year, our bar associations and legal practitioners have had to speak out against such conduct. I wish to remind legal advisors as officers of the court and who seemingly stay silent in the face of these unwarranted attacks that they become enablers and complicit in the undermining of the administration of justice. This behavior must be publicly and vociferously rebuffed at every turn, as silence in the face of these attacks only serves to give them credence. While it is proper to criticize a judicial decision, and otherwise engage through the well-recognized process for appeals, it is quite wrong to engage in baseless personal attacks against a judicial officer and the judiciary as a whole, merely because a decision has gone against you. It is worth reminding that judicial officers take an oath to do justice according to law, not according to man or woman. It was Aristotle who said, and I quote, at his best, man is the noblest of all animals. Separated from law and justice, he is the worst, end of quote. 
And so, let us seek to abide by the rule of law. On a related note, I also wish to remind that the judicial branch of government remains an independent and essential check on all forms of power and on all threats of injustice for the protection of every individual's rights and freedoms. We must therefore never allow ourselves to be lulled into a sense of complacency or invite or encourage a blurring or crossing of boundaries between the judicial branch and other branches of government. Neither should unwarranted attacks on the judiciary be allowed to become an acceptable norm of behavior, irrespective of whose lips the utterances may come. Our judges must therefore remain resolute, confident, and vigilant in rendering justice without fear or favor in accordance with their oath. I feel compelled, however, to place on record our appreciation for the support of the OECS Bar Association and the constituent bar associations of the Eastern Caribbean in vociferously speaking out in defense of the judiciary and our judicial officers in circumstances where the court cannot speak for itself. At this juncture, I wish to thank our judicial officers for their hard work over the last year. I also wish to recognize those high court judges who retired from the court last year after several years of sterling service. I recognize Her Ladyship, the Honorable Justice Rosalind Wilkinson, who over her time with the court served St. Lucia and Antigua and Barbuda. I also recognize Her Ladyship, the Honorable Justice Lorraine Williams, for her service to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis and St. Lucia. Mention must also be made of Justice Godfrey Smith, who demitted the Office of High Court Judge in March 2020, after three years of service to St. Lucia and several other member states and territories where he did shorter stints. And also Justice Eddie Ventos, who demitted office as a High Court Judge on the 31st of December, 2020. I wish them the very best in their future endeavors and express on behalf of the entire judiciary and on my own behalf, sincere thanks and gratitude for their service to the people of the Eastern Caribbean. It would be remiss of me to not also announce the new judicial appointments made during the last year. I welcome Queen's Counsel, now Justice of Appeal, Gerard Ferrara, who was appointed to the Court of Appeal in June 2020. Her Ladyship, the Honorable Justice Angelica Tilak Singh, who was confirmed as High Court Judge assigned to St. Vincent and the Grenadines in November 2020, and Master Tamara Gill, who was confirmed as a Master in September 2020. They have provided tremendous assistance to the court during previous acting appointments over the years, and I am pleased to now welcome them as permanent members of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court bench. I also wish to extend my gratitude to Mr. Ricardo Sancroft, who over the last year acted as a master for the jurisdictions of Anguilla, St. Lucia, and the territory of the Virgin Islands, as well as to the many other legal practitioners and retired judges who assisted the court over the last year, offering their time to take up acting appointments to fill voids on the bench during what turned out to be a very turbulent but also busy year. 
on a more somber note, last year, the court's headquarters bade farewell to one of our beloved members of staff, Mr. Irving Ferdinand, who served the court's headquarters as our accountants since 2003. The judicial officers, management and staff of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court will forever cherish the memory of his hard work, discipline and good humor. The Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court has sought to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic as best it can. We continue to learn and draw from the experiences of others as we continue to review our processes with a view towards improvement. What we have achieved so far could not have been possible without the assistance of our stakeholders, partners, and donor agencies. On behalf of the entire judiciary, I express sincere thanks to the governments of all our states and territories, the jurist team, the impact justice team, the United States Embassy, the British High Commission, University of the West Indies, UWI-TV team, UNICEF, UN Women, UNDP, as well as all those not specifically mentioned for their continued support of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court in our endeavors to provide access to a system of justice that is fair, efficient, and accountable. It would be unforgivable if I were to come to a close without extending my profound gratitude to all those persons who have been instrumental in the court's continued operation during the last year, in particular, our staff at the court's headquarters and in the various high court offices, members of the public and private bars, as well as you, the people of the Eastern Caribbean. At the risk of sounding cliche, it would not have been possible to weather the COVID-19 pandemic without you. Our commitment and pledge is to continue to serve you, the people of the Eastern Caribbean, to the best of our ability. I thank you for your support and hope that it will continue as we continue our journey in managing the COVID quake and beyond. I remain humbled by the honor and privilege of serving you as your Chief Justice over the last eight years. I pray that as we embark upon this new year, the Almighty will bestow his richest blessings upon each member state and territory and upon us all, and that we emerge from the fog of this pandemic with a clarity of vision and purpose, more together and infinitely stronger. I thank you. Now to address us will be the Honorable Stedroy Q.T. Benjamin, the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs of Antigua and Barbuda. He was awarded the degree of an utter barrister at the Honorable Society of Grays Inn on the 4th of July, 1980. He was called to the Bar of England and Wales on the 24th of July, 1980. On the 14th of January, 1981, he was admitted as a barrister of the West Indies Associated Supreme Court, Antigua Circuit, and he was subsequently admitted to practice throughout the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. He has had a long and distinguished professional and legal career. He has held the post of Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs in Antigua and Barbuda since June 2014. And so, to present the address on behalf of Antigua and Barbuda, I give you the Honorable Steroy QT Benjamin. Thank you very kindly, my lord. Good morning, colleagues. May it please the court, my lady. I consider it a distinct honor and privilege to be invited by the Honorable Learned Chief Justice to deliver this short address on this occasion, the virtual ceremonial opening 
of Law Year 2021. Again, I'm indeed very humbled. There is no doubt that the dreaded COVID-19 infectious disease caused massive destructions in our judicial system. Our courts had to respond quickly to the challenges presented by the pandemic with its associated protocols to include social distancing and the wearing of face masks. These developments created significant challenges for our jurisdiction. The justice system struggled to cope with new ways of operating. Out of necessity, we transitioned from being primarily traditional face-to-face -face proceedings to online processes supported by internet technology. It is to be noted, however, that this shift from our traditional court processes to an online mode assisted the public, the lawyers and experts to address the justice system during the crisis thus far. And it is hoped that this trend will continue even after the crisis is over. Even though COVID-19 has upended the entire world and has affected every aspect of our legal life, we were and still are determined to ensure that our populations in the OECS and particularly in Antigua and Barbuda were and are not denied access to justice. This means access to the courts and to the judges without unreasonable delay. In Antigua and Barbuda, led by the Attorney General's Chambers, we adopted to the new working environment. We were determined to ensure that every court, the High Court, the Industrial Court, the Family Court, and the Metroids Court continued to function as close to normal as possible. We were loath to the idea of postponing or cancelling proceedings in response to the spread of the virus. What we did, we got our loins and joined the battle. Words taken from our national anthem against the COVID quick. Some of the processes we followed in this country, I'm sure, were adopted in other jurisdictions. But coping with the situation, we did. We were determined to provide judicial and legal services no matter the challenges. In Roman history, you know, and according to the famous Latin expression, referring to Caesar, it is written, Vini, Vici, victim. When translated, it means he came, he saw, he conquered. In our jurisdiction, COVID came, visited the islands, but it was not allowed to prevent the court from providing judicial and legal services to our populations. It certainly did not, has not, and will not conquer. So far, we've quietened and coped effectively with the COVID quake. So what did we do in our jurisdiction of Antigua and Barbuda? In the criminal division, to combat the virus, the decision was taken to restrict or end jury trials. This was due to health protocols introduced. Judicial officers, attorneys, jurors, and witnesses alike were apprehensive and downright afraid to attend court. Jury trials, as we all are aware, often require great numbers of persons to be gathered together in a courtroom at the same time for long periods. This caused angst and consternation among the stakeholders involved. Notwithstanding, through stringent case management, outstanding matters during this period often came to a satisfactory conclusion through guilty pleas or by discontinuance. By these means, outstanding matters were reduced significantly. To encourage and continue criminal trials, henceforth, the courtrooms and jury rooms will be retrofitted to ensure the safety of all stakeholders involved. It is hoped that criminal trials will resume fully in January 2021. Discussions are ongoing presently, touching the question of trials by judge alone in some criminal matters. That is being given very serious consideration at this time. With respect to our penal institutions, Efforts were made to reduce jail admissions, and there were remission of sentences where appropriate. Within the prison administration, there was initially the suspension 
and thereafter the reduction of prison visitation. Measures were introduced to ensure minimal and unnecessary contact. COVID protocols were vigorously enforced. That is to say, the wearing of masks, social distancing, and personal hygiene. The civil division performed extremely well during the COVID-19 lockdown, and it has continued to perform well. Practically all matters, including chambers and trial matters, which were adjourned due to COVID, were disposed of. Since those matters were rescheduled and were dealt with during the vacation period, may I be so bold at this stage to state that the judges must be commended for giving up part of their vacation to ensure that matters were dealt with. The court administrators are to be highly commended as well for their dedication to this effort. But we did not stop there. We encouraged or required the teleconferences and video conferences in lieu of in-person hearings. Of course, guided at all times by practice direction number five of 2020, styled COVID-19 emergency measures. In that regard, I say in-person proceedings generally were suspended. The use of technology allowed us to conduct business as usual. In fact, even though one of our judges sits remotely from Grenada, this has not slowed down the business of the court. Initial reluctance by some attorneys to scan their files for the judge, sitting remotely abated. Since this was an excellent opportunity to migrate those files to the portal, which they will have to do in the future. During this period also, the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court allotted additional Zoom licenses to the court. This facilitated simultaneous hearings on a daily basis. Additional Zoom licenses were also given to the mediation project so that mediations have been proceeding in the usual matter. There were two sittings of the Court of Appeal in May and September 2020. I submit that serious thought ought to be given for the sittings of this court to continue by video conference in the future. In fact, research shows that by so doing, the court would save approximately $50,000 per sitting. Food for thought, milady. We still await the grant funding from Jurist to improve our facilities to allow for COVID protocols to improve. In the meantime, however, we restricted entrances to the court and heightened security measures designed to enforce adherence to the COVID protocols. Similar measures were appropriate and were adopted in the land registry, the civil registry, the industrial court, the family court, and the magistrate's court. Learned colleagues, I say to you these words, we should not, we ought not, we cannot, and we certainly shall not cover to the onslaught and quake of COVID-19. On the leadership of her ladyship, the Learned Chief Justice, we shall continue to allow our po populations to have access to justice. We are here to serve and serve we shall, through any and in all circumstances, including this COVID-19 pandemic. May it please the court, milady. We will next hear from the Honorable John D. Martin, the Attorney General of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The Honorable John D. Martin was a graduate from the Hugh Wooding Law School in the year 1998. He was later that year admitted as a barrister at law. In the early part of his career, the Honorable John de Martin was engaged in the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions as Crown Counsel here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. There, he developed an interest in civil litigation, and he was appointed to the Office of the Attorney General as Crown Counsel and then Senior Crown Counsel. In his career, the Honorable John de Martin has held several posts, including a Registrar of the Family Court. He is also a court-appointed mediator for the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. So this morning, to address us on behalf of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Honorable John D. Martin. May it please your lordships, please permit 
permit me to adopt the already established protocol for this ceremonial opening of lawyer 2021 and I would like to wish a good day to all. It is indeed once again an honor for me to address the ceremonial opening of this lawyer 2021 as we as always recognize the critical importance of the rule of law to the continued existence of our cherished democratic freedoms, achievements and obligations to each other as well as the functioning of our judicial institutions in maintaining the balance. This year's theme, as promulgated by our distinguished Chief Justice, Her Ladyship, the Honorable Dame Justice Pereira, titled The ECSC Managing the COVID Quake, is set in the context of the burgeoning crisis that this pandemic has set upon us over the past year or so. It clearly has not been business as usual. And under the leadership of Her Ladyship, the Honorable Dame Pereira, we have been adjusting to and managing the changes wrought by this COVID quake. This year's ceremony would have occurred in my country, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And we do regret the opportunity of being greased by the physical presence of Her Ladyship with the solemnity of the ceremony, which is an impactful reminder to all of us who function within the OECS justice system of our important rules and duties. I am convinced, however, that this virtual ceremony will be just as impactful, given the achievements that we have made over the years, with virtual sittings having become the normal way of conducting the business of the court, and this applies to most peripheral businesses as well. It is time, it is a time that we must cherish the gift of leadership that Her Ladyship, the Lord Chief Justice, has given to us as we continue to realize continuity in the dispatch of justice to the citizens of our various territories. We thank her for facilitating and ensuring our adjustment to what has become the new normal. We are also thankful to our leaders as they have gifted us with their leadership skills in marshalling the resource of our people and the institutions of our society as in partnership we have been able to avert the wars of this crisis in our sub-region. New legislative and regulatory measures had to be implemented at very short notice, empowering our various judicial, health, and security sectors with additional powers to protect our people. In some jurisdictions, curfew and lockdown measures were implemented to limit physical interactions and ensure social distancing. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we aggressively monitor our borders, screen all arrivals, and educate our people with whom we have developed a relationship of trust and respect when it comes to addressing their own safety. At this time, we must also recognize the critical importance of our telecom sector and the media to our continued operation as a court system. Without them, our judiciary would have been at a standstill. Our service providers have been very accommodating and we have worked in many cases to alleviate inadequacies and upgrade outdated systems to enable smooth access to relevant platforms. Without the Agency for Public Information, for instance, I will not be able to make these remarks. I am very grateful and we must thank them for their contribution to our society's continued performance. In each year's address, our learned Chief Justice has reminded us of the limited resources in terms of finances, manpower, and physical space which our court has to employ in performing its task. The COVID pandemic has no doubt highlighted this message even more starkly. In particular, the need for practitioners in the region to further embrace the utility of ADR in addressing matters of dispute looms to the forefront. This form of dispute settlement has had some success in the region and with the appointment of a new regional mediation coordinator and new mediation committees in the various territories, it is time that practitioners 
embrace EDR to assist our courts to settle disputes. After all, it is a solution but that most often than not succeed in mending broken relationships. Our people are inherently strong, having been molded by a brutal history. We have in our lifetime seen the devastation of hurricanes, and though in the past our ceremonial sitting has been suspended, as a result, we have surveyed and assessed, and through the strong leadership of our Lord and Chief Justice, risen stronger from such devastation by moving our ceremony out of the way of the storms to January. Yet again, we have another challenge to our ceremony by way of this COVID quake. Our proven leader, as expected, has already solved this problem by way of this virtual opening ceremony. A second apparently more deadly phase of this pandemic looms large on our horizon of reality. But we can have faith in Almighty God, our leaders throughout the sub-region, and our Chief Justice to take our people safely through the trembles of this COVID quake. I therefore wish to thank your Lordships and each and every member of the profession, our health workers, security personnel, as well as the public, and wish all a healthy and prosperous New Year. Our next speaker is Mr. Christopher Nelson. Mr. Nelson is the Director of Public Prosecutions of Grenada and has been a career prosecutor. He was called to the bar in October 1990 and thereupon commenced his prosecuting career as Crown Counsel in the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions in Grenada. In January 2001, he was appointed to the position of Director of Public Prosecutions. He has held that position since then, making him one of the longest serving DPPs in the region. In July 2015, Mr. Nelson was admitted to the inner bar. To address us today on behalf of the Directors of Public Prosecutions and the representative of Grenada, Mr. Christopher Nelson, QC. My Lady Chief Justice, my lords, my ladies, masters, the excellencies, heads of state, prime ministers, chief minister, magistrates, registrars, colleagues at the bar. The centerpiece of our criminal justice system is trial by jury. Scores are summoned as a panel and as many as 14 or 15 could be impaneled for a trial. A fundamental requirement is the jurors must be kept together during the trial. But the edict now is social distancing in light of COVID-19. It is difficult to synchronize the two. And so jury trials came to a screeching halt as did much of the work of the court. The powerful shock waves of COVID quake rocked offices of DPP from Grenada in the south to the BVI in the north. We, in conjunction with our stakeholders, had to adjust quickly. In the rare instances where judge-only trial existed, the disruption was limited. But for most of us, it was and continues to be a problem. All spaces had to be used differently. But where this was not possible, new ones had to be found that could accommodate the new requirements for trials. Adjustments had to be made in the manner of leading evidence in court. Resort was had to witnesses given evidence remotely, where possible utilizing modern communication technology. Viva Voce evidence gave way to documentary or written evidence where permissible. The cooperation of defense counsel is crucial in this regard, where consent is necessary as a precondition for admissibility. Paper committal procedure proved to be a valuable tool 
in facilitating and expediting preliminary inquiries. COVID quake has pushed us DPPs, as everyone else, to go virtual as opposed to in person with aspects of our general operations. This has been the norm for conferences, workshops, seminars, and meetings. Witness briefings and other aspects of preparation of case have also gone in that direction too. The aftershocks of COVID quake will continue to affect us in the new year. The added pressures of the pandemic will cause the wheels of our old and aging criminal justice infrastructure to turn painfully slower. But unlike Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poetic assertion, it will not grind finder. A coarser justice product will be the result unless major retrofitting is carried out in 2021. Judge-only trials, smaller juries, paper committal, documentary evidence, and virtual evidence, just to name a few, must have greater prominence within the infrastructure. Best wishes to all for 2021. May it so please the court. The next speaker is Ms. Tamia Richards. She is the senior magistrate for the territory of the Virgin Islands. Ms. Richards was called to the bar in 2003. She initially practiced at the Attorney General's Chambers and then at the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. She later enjoyed a short stint in private practice before finding her true love, which is the judiciary. In 2012, she assumed the position of senior magistrate. To address us today on behalf of the, of the magistracy and as representative of the territory of the Virgin Islands, Ms. Tamia Richards. My lords, my ladies, May it please you, I adopt a protocol that has already been established, but please permit me the opportunity to acknowledge the following persons. Her Ladyship, the Honorable Dame Janice M. Pereira, Chief Justice, Judges and Masters, Their Excellencies, Heads of States, Prime Ministers and Chief Ministers, Magistrates, Registrars and Members of the Bar, it is indeed an honor to be able to address you on this very special occasion, the ceremonial opening of another law year. I bring you warm greetings and best regards for a healthy and prosperous 2021 and a successful law year from the beautiful territory of the Virgin Islands. For this year's opening, I have been asked to address you on behalf of the magistrate's courts of the member states. As you all are aware, the year 2020 is certainly one for the record books. It was not the best of times. It was a trying time. It was an anxious time. The COVID-19 pandemic has proven itself to be a formidable, invisible enemy. In order to control the spread of this deadly unseen enemy, countries of the world and this region have had to impose stringent measures, total lockdowns, partial lockdowns, curfews, social distancing, the wearing of masks and personal protective equipment have become the new normal. And with these measures, the magistracy have had to resort to alternative means of rendering justice. Justice delayed is justice denied, holds true, even in the age of a global pandemic. Some jurisdictions due to legislative restrictions must have in-person hearings. In order to continue to render effective justice and safeguard both clients and staff, these jurisdictions have implemented measures such as an appointment system, and they control the number of persons present in their courtrooms and on the court's premises at any given time. To keep abreast of the unseen enemy, they provide sanitation, require the wearing of PPE in the courtroom, and they keep registers of persons who come into contact with their staff so that in the event of an outbreak, contact tracing by the authorities will be easier. Some courts, in addition to live hearings, 
have resorted to virtual hearings utilizing the platform Zoom or Microsoft Teams for such matters that are permissible under law, such as bail applications, first appearance or arrest matters, and affiliation matters, where, litiga where litigants and their attorneys have access to the necessary internet capacity for an effective hearing. Such hearings have proven useful for attorneys and litigants alike who found themselves locked out of jurisdictions when borders were closed or restricted. Other jurisdictions, such as St. Lucia, have implemented a mixed system. In that system, magistrates sit in their chambers and attend the hearings remotely via personal computer computers, while orderlies monitor litigants in adjoining courtrooms, judicial clerks sit at their desks in their offices controlling the Zoom calls, and attorneys access the hearings from their offices. The orderlies bring physical evidence which is tendered or to be tendered to the attention of the presiding magistrate. In this way, contact is minimized amongst persons who are not of the same household. Unfortunately, in some jurisdictions, there remains a lack of resources, PPE, video link equipment, and proper broadband in order to meet the demands of rendering justice in the age of a pandemic. Nevertheless, the magistrates' courts in the region are committed to rendering justice fairly and swiftly, and with God's help, they will continue to endure. My lords and my ladies, may it please you. Our next speaker is Mr. Charles Wilkin, Queen's Counsel. Mr. Charles Wilkin, QC, is in his 50th year of practice at the bar of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. He attended Cambridge University in England and was later called to the bar at Lincoln's Inn at the age of 22. Mr. Wilkins served as president of the St. Kitts and Nevis Bar Association from 1993 to 1994 and again from 2009 to 2016. In 1998, Mr. Wilkins was appointed as Queen's Counsel. In 2009, Mr. Wilkin was honored by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II with the award of Companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George for services to the law in St. Kitts and Nevis. To address us this morning on behalf of St. Kitts and Nevis and as a representative of the inner bar, Mr. Charles Wilkin QC. Milady, the Honorable Chief Justice, Judges and Masters, their Excellencies, Heads of State, Prime Ministers, Chief Minister, Magistrates, Registrars, Members of the Bar, and other distinguished ladies and gentlemen whose presence has been recognized in the protocol list established by the Master of Ceremonies. It is commonly said that life will not be the same after COVID. That is only partly correct. Lifestyles have changed, some permanently. More will change. But the virus has not affected basic human nature. Managing the COVID quick will require careful attention to and precaution against the negative forces of human nature while ourselves exhibiting and promoting the positive ones. The Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court has been proactive in managing its system during the pandemic and has been able, through effective organization and the use of technology, to provide continued access to justice. No doubt, the court will look at the legal and other ramifications of making permanent the conduct of virtual hearings and trials. That process has been very effective during the pandemic and saved enormously in expenses. Once the correct balance can be struck and the access by litigants and witnesses to technology can be ensured in each case, there is every reason why this should become part of the new norm for civil cases 
and where appropriate criminal trials as well. I am sure that many of our profession have enjoyed addressing the court from a desk or bed and that our judges are not complaining about the reduction in travel. The necessity for a state of emergency and curfews and other restrictions on daily life in all of our territories have given the pandemic a legal perspective. Legal arguments have been used and fundamental rights invoked to challenge the restrictions imposed. One of the most glaringly foolish of such arguments has been that mask mandates offend personal freedom. Many within my community of St. Kitts and Nevis do not say so, but reflect that argument in their casual attitude to the wearing of masks and to other safety protocols. In the early days of the lockdown, a caller to a public information television program claimed that her freedom of religion was offended by closure of the churches which, and I quote her, prevented her from going to her church to talk with her God. I am sure that pastors and, dare I say, lawyers have sought to disabuse those with such selfish and naive thoughts. There is an essential role for the profession to address these negative attitudes by way of public education. We must bear in mind that technology is a double-edged sword and all the more so during the pandemic as the downtime has allowed idle and devious minds to expand its use for disinformation, intolerance, racism, bigotry, abuse and threats. We have with great dismay watched these growing practices infiltrate public discourse and political debate and sabotage national efforts to address the pandemic in our biggest neighbors to the north and the south. We have seen the resulting threats posed to the rule of law and democracy there. We should not assume that the abuses of technology with the results seen in our big neighbors cannot have the same effect here. Negative attitudes and behavior can be extremely contagious, especially when so easily promulgated. We have in recent times seen instances of the abuse of social media under the anonymity allowed by the technology to insult, threaten and attack judges. There have been attacks and threats in social media against a judge in St. Kitts and Nevis to which our Bar Association reacted promptly and strongly. We are aware of the recent verbal attack by a political leader in Dominica on the resident judge, which was an outrageous disgrace. And we have read of more than 800 former judges and senior legal figures in the UK writing to the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary there, accusing them of endangering the personal safety of lawyers through their abusive attacks on the profession. Such attacks are not new in our jurisdiction. We should never forget that within the first year of its establishment in 1967, our court, then the West Indies Associated States Supreme Court, faced its first such challenge. That attempted quick occurred when the House of Assembly of St. Kitts, Nevis and Anguilla passed what it called a motion of no confidence in the court, which it accused of bias. That ill-advised naivete was prompted by the dissatisfaction of the government with the outcome of trials of opposition members during the state of emergency introduced following the secession of Anguilla. That attack followed physical threats against the trial judge and a demonstration outside the hotel at which he was staying. The Chief Justice, Sir Alan Lewis, quickly took a flight to St. Kitts, convened an immediate sitting of the court and reminded the government and the public 
in very strong terms of the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary. There was also a direct attack on the legal profession by the crude deportation of a lawyer who was involved in the defense of opposition politicians and the declaration of others as persona non grata. Fortunately for the entire region, the Chief Justice's intervention had the desired effect and provided a solid foundation for our court. His address is an important part of the history of this Honorable Court. While the court and the profession are not above criticism, there must be limits to protect the rule of law, the separation of powers, and the fundamental rights of our clients to legal representation and confidentiality. With the problem apparent and likely to grow, the profession should continue to be proactive in facing this threat and in setting the parameters for appropriate criticism and comment. I respectfully suggest that the separation of powers will not be complete so long as the magistracy and the appointment of registrars and senior officials of the court remain within the purview and control of the executive. To that end, the court should press to bring the magistracy entirely within its structure. The appointment of registrars and senior court staff in the circuits should also be transferred to the court. One of the most effective ways in which we can contribute to the management of COVID has little to do with the law. It is to rally all involved in the legal system and others with whom we have contact to wear masks and to show respect for the safety of each other and to adhere to the basic protocols which have proven to be the best defense against and the best way to manage the virus. May it please the court. Our next speaker will be Ms. Jean M. Dyer. Ms. Dyer's legal career started in 2003 as a Crown Counsel in the Attorney General's Chambers in Montserrat. She relocated to Anguilla in 2006, where she joined the law firm of Keithley Lake and Associates. In 2018, in the month of January, she established her own practice, J.M. Dyer and Company. Ms. Dyer is the immediate past president of the Anguilla Bar Association. She has a keen interest in continuing legal education and has served as the coordinator of the OECS Bar Association's annual regional law conference from 2013 to date. On the 3rd of October 2020, she was, ele she was elected president of the OECS Bar Association. She is only the second female president of the association since its formation in 1989. And so to present the address on behalf of the OECS Bar, I give you Ms. Jean Dyer. Your Ladyship Dane Janice Pereira, DBE, Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, Honorable Justice of Appeal, Judges and Masters of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, their excellencies, heads of state of each of the OECS member states and territories, honorable heads of government of each of the OECS member states and territories, chief and senior magistrates and magistrates of each of the OECS member states and territories, Mrs. Mitchell John Tibbles, chief registrar of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, registrars and deputy and assistant registrars, of the High Court of each of the OECS member states and territories, presidents of the Constituent Bar Associations of each of the OECS member states and territories, learned members of the Inner and Outer Bar of each of the OECS member states and territories, citizens and residents of the Eastern Caribbean. Good morning. My Lord Cottle, I have the honor and privilege this morning of addressing this esteemed virtual gathering on the occasion of the opening of the new law year 2021. It is with pleasure that I do so for the first time on behalf of the OECS Bar Association in my capacity as president. Today marks the sunset of the preceding 365 days over which tradition dictates 
that we are to reflect upon the past year. I dare say without fear of contradiction that 2020 was a most challenging year. We are certainly in unprecedented times as we face the challenge of the spread of the COVID-19 virus. It is therefore appropriate for me to begin my address by thanking the Almighty God for sparing our lives to witness yet another occasion of the opening of a new law year. As we advance into 2021, one is immediately struck by the magnitude of issues that required our attention in 2020. The constraints of time, however, forbid consideration of all of them. With your leave, my Lord, today I would like to say a few words about our collective responses to the coronavirus pandemic and the impact of budgetary constraints on the rule of law. This is an important aspect of the administration of justice. I will also touch briefly on the OECS Bar Association's work plan for 2021-2022. The pandemic and states and territories responses to it are having an unprecedented effect on the functioning of judicial systems, not only in the OECS, but globally. Few countries, if any, were prepared to handle the consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. Understandably, governments have focused on the health response and are taking measures to reduce the spread of the virus. We must, however, try our best to minimize the impact of budgetary constraints on the rule of law. Indeed, in difficult times, as at all times, it is of fundamental importance that the quality of justice must not be compromised. A pandemic should never cause the courts or access to justice to become broken. The commitment to the rule of law was one of the driving forces behind our court's response to the coronavirus pandemic. Even before the true scale of the challenges became known, our court led by our Honorable Chief Justice had in place mechanisms to keep the system moving by using technology. Our e-litigation portal, which was then live in most of our member states and territories, allowed us to electronically file and serve documents. The strides taken by our court were in clear recognition that justice cannot be quarantined. Indeed, justice delayed is justice denied. I commend our Chief Justice and pay tribute to the other members of the judiciary and court staff for their determination to keep the wheels of justice turning in these unprecedented times. Whilst we've made progress, more needs to be done. Due to the nature of judicial processes, such as in-person participation in criminal and some other trials, our formal justice system is not equipped to fully function remotely in the context of a quote-unquote shutdown. Whilst we've made use of the technology, some hearings, such as jury trials, cannot happen remotely. Jury trials have therefore been suspended in a number of our states and territories, and this suspension is likely to cause a backlog of criminal cases. This is of concern. It is vital the solutions, whether temporary or permanent, that limit the chances of miscarriage of justice and maintain public faith in the judicial system be explored. Some possibilities include retrofitting our courts and putting in place the necessary social distancing measures so that hearings can take place safely in person. We have to find ways of getting jury trials moving at pace once more. This is because the right to trial by our fellow citizens is fundamental to our democracy. Indeed, as was famously said by Lord Devin, trial by jury is the lamp that shows that freedom lives. This right ought not to be lightly interfered with. Lawyers and bar associations play a vital role in preserving the rule of law when developments threaten its integrity. There is a burden placed on us as lawyers, which no other person in our community has to carry. We at the OECS bar will continue to be the guardians of our constitutions and the rule of law. We will continue to be the voice of those who cannot speak, the strength of those who cannot stand, guardians of the meek, and the hope of those who no longer believe. 
I would however urge our members of parliament to be mindful of the rights of our people in formulating new laws to address the coronavirus crisis and to ensure that they are in line with our constitutions. Limitations on fundamental freedoms should be proportionate, time bound and subject to review. I now come to the OECS Bar Association's work plan for this year. Despite COVID-19, there is much that we should do in the upcoming year. It is our intention at the OECS Bar to continue to strive to fulfill our mandate. At the forefront of the OECS Bar's commitment to excellence is the need to ensure high standards and quality lawyering. Knowledge is not static and to be frozen in ignorance is disastrous. We therefore need to continue to sharpen our mental saw so that we can maintain our cutting edge in practice. The OECS Bar intends to continue to drive professional excellence within the OECS. Given the lockdowns due to the pandemic and the resulting closure of our borders, we were forced to postpone our annual law conference and to hold a virtual one instead. Whilst this was on chartered waters, by all accounts, our 2020 Virtually Together Conference, which had over 200 judges and lawyers in attendance, was a success. The OECS Bar Council intends to continue to make use of the technology by holding at least one virtual seminar per quarter. Any forward thinking must inevitably lead us to focus on our future generations of lawyers. We recognize the peculiar challenges faced by new entrants to the profession and we are alive to their anxieties. To this end, our training will target junior practitioners, and particularly those who are sole practitioners. My Lord, we will also be focusing on staying mentally healthy during these challenging times. While skilled in handling high pressure situations, lawyers are now being pushed like never before. COVID-19 has amplified stress and anxiety about finances, job security, providing and caring for our families and the health of our loved ones. Criminal lawyers are being hampered in their inability to attend court as jury trials were suspended in an attempt to safeguard those attending court. All of this is happening in a new, unfamiliar and rapidly changing economy and a different geographical location as many have started to work from home. The OECS Bar intends to work to destigmatize mental illness, recommend best practices and remedies, and help bring more balance into our members' daily professional lives. To this end, we intend to, among other things, introduce an annual wellness retreat where members can disconnect and focus on health and wellness. We hope that talking about attorney's wellness and having increased available resources will make a positive impact on lawyers in the OECS and will help to create a climate in which lawyers with mental health issues feel less stigmatized. My Lord, these are a few of the activities which the OECS Bar will undertake during the course of this year. Time does not permit me to address the others, save to mention that the self-regulation of lawyers has and continues to be the highest priority of the OECS Bar. The OECS Bar is therefore presently contemplating possible reforms to the way the profession is regulated in our member states and territories. The Commonwealth of Dominica and St. Vincent and the Grenadines are, despite the efforts of the Bar Association in those states, yet to enact a Legal Profession Act. This is of concern. I would respectfully urge the governments in those member states to prioritize the enactment of the Legal Profession Act which is intended to be the principal statute by which the legal profession is regulated. The bar association in your jurisdictions cannot continue to exist as voluntary organizations with no binding powers. In my view, a statutory body which is mandated by your respective parliaments will go a long way in protecting the interests of clients and also the public interest. I would therefore urge the governments in the Commonwealth of Dominica and St. Vincent and the Grenadines to use your best efforts to ensure that legal professional acts are enacted in your jurisdictions during this year. 
In conclusion, I once again wish to thank each and every one of you for joining us to celebrate this important day in our calendar. As we will leave behind last year, we must enter into the new law year with optimism and fortitude. Believing the best is always in front of us and not behind us. As far as the administration of justice is concerned, I assure you, my Lord, of the OECS bar's continued support for the judiciary. We hope that the bar and bench meetings will continue and or resume in each member state and territory during this new law year so that we can continue to tackle the issues which may undermine the administration of justice in the OECS. My Lord, it only remains for me to acknowledge the contributions of my predecessor, Mr. Thaddeus Antoine, who spent a fruitful four years as the president of the OECS Bar Association and served both the OECS Bar and the wider cause of the administration of justice with dedication and distinction. It is my task to carry on where he left off, as well as to face the new challenges which the upcoming year will bring. This I intend to do with the support of the executive members of the OECS Bar Association and also the various constituent bars. Thank you for listening and I wish everyone the very best for the legal year ahead. Make so please the court. The next speaker, Mrs. Heather F. Felix Evans is the president of the Dominica Bar Association. She has been a member of the legal fraternity for the past 27 years, having been called to the Dominica Bar in October 1993. She worked in the public service as a state attorney and as the senior state attorney from 1993 to August 2001. Mrs. Felix Evans has had her own private law practice in the Commonwealth of Dominica since September 2001. Mrs. Felix Evans is a practicing court-appointed mediator and has been so since October 2004. To address us today, on behalf of the Constituent Bar Associations and the Commonwealth of Dominica, Mrs. Heather Felix Evans. Madam Chief Justice, Judges and Masters, Their Excellencies, Heads of State, Prime Ministers and Chief Minister, Magistrates, Registrars, Members of the Bar, and all persons who have been recognized on the protocol list established by Honorable Justice Brian Cottle, good morning, Happy New Year, and Happy New Law Year. After a year of what included, all of us hope, a once-in-a-century global pandemic experience, on behalf of the bar associations of the OECS member states and territories, I am happy to report that we plowed through the experience with grit and resilience and had many accomplishments, a few of which I shall briefly mention. The COVID-19 pandemic caused the dispersion of BVI Bar Association members to places far and wide. As a means of keeping its members together and engaged, the association organized a webinar series to increase training and contact with international aspects of the BVI practice. The Court of Appeal judgment in May 2020 galvanized the BVI Bar Association into spearheading the production of new legislation the purpose of which is to give the BVI courts the jurisdiction to grant a freestanding interlocutory injunction in aid of foreign proceedings. The proposed new legislation is now awaiting government's consideration. The Dominica Bar Association's first planned activity was held in February with the hosting of a one-day free legal consultation for members of the public. Shortly thereafter, the COVID-19 pandemic upended everyday life and business operations as we knew them. 
The association provided support and assistance to the registrar and the high court judges upon request in the very early days of before the issue of the COVID-19 emergency measures practice direction. The association continued to provide financial support to high school students whose families were displaced by the passage of Tropical Storm Erica in 2015. Most recently, the executive made effective representation on behalf of its membership to the government after it was surprisingly announced at the budget address in July 2020 that the statutorily prescribed maximum solicitor's fee for land transfers would be cut by 50%. As a result of the association's representation, that prescribed maximum solicitor's fee was reduced, not by the proposed 50%, but by 17%. Sadly, three active and well-respected members of the bar passed away during the year. Mr. Kevin Williams, civil practitioner and husband of fellow legal practitioner, Mrs. Singwala Bloomquist Williams, Ms. Sandra Julian, registrar of companies and intellectual property, and Mr. Michael Bruni, private practitioner, part-time magistrate, and former registrar of the High Court. Their deaths, all of which happened within a period of five months, struck a severe blow to the profession. The Grenada Bar Association began the year with a letter to the Solicitor General on 6 January 2020, expressing concern about the proposed amendments to the Criminal Code and requesting a meeting to discuss the same. While no meeting was convened, the Association was informed that its concerns were being considered by the Office of the DPP. Law Week 2020 was held from 1st to 7th March under the theme Responding to Crisis, Striving for Excellence. The association had little time to relish the success of that production before it was faced with the COVID-19 situation. The association submitted written comments to the Attorney General in respect of the first iteration of the emergency COVID regulations and made effective representations to the relevant government departments to be granted an exemption to access law offices and to extend the time for filing of personal income tax and stamp tax returns due annually on the 31st of March. The association provided members with draft protocols for office operations during COVID-19, kept members continually updated and carried out wellness checks on its more vulnerable members. In July 2020, yoga and wellness practitioner Malika Lo Maitland led lawyers in basic yoga techniques designed to assist with improving posture and breathing and reducing stress. Two members of the profession passed away during the year. Mr. Dennis Lambert, a long-standing exemplary public servant and colleague, and her honor Karen Noel. A special sitting was held in respect of both to celebrate their lives and contributions. With the use of the Zoom platform, the St. Kitts and Nevis Bar Association hosted three continuing legal education sessions, which saw the participation of bar members from the region. However, the highlight of the year for the association was Law Week, which ran from the 1st to 7th November. Among the several events in that production, the association was most proud of a moot with the sixth form students of the Clarence Fitzroy Community College that was streamed live on the association's Facebook page. Their contribution of $3,550 worth of appliances and goods to the flamboyant nursing home for the aged in, in Nevis. 
the Tip of the Day program, which increased public legal education and a continuing legal education symposium webinar, which showcased regional legal luminaries addressing the current topics like the constitutionality of COVID-19 restrictions and the future of the digital courtroom in light of COVID-19. The St. Lucia Bar Association published a COVID-19 protocol to assist lawyers in managing their law firms during the pandemic and successfully made representations for law offices to be included in the definition of essential services, thereby enabling lawyers to operate from their offices during the lockdown. The association provided support to the registrar and the chief registrar upon request and offered recommendations for amendments to the COVID-19 emergency measures practice direction. Currently, the association is pressing for legislative amendments that would give accused persons the right to opt for trial by a judge only, or by a judge and two laypersons, or by a judge and a reduced jury pool. The activities planned by the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Bar Association for Lawyer 2020 were shelved as a result of the lockdowns and restrictions brought about by COVID-19. To ensure that the practice of law continued safely and in compliance with the recommended safety protocols, lawyers agreed to accept service via email and introduced COVID protocols at their chambers. At the invitation of the Clerk of the House of Assembly, representatives of the St. Vincent and Grenadines Bar continued to attend and participate in the business of various select committees of the Parliament to review bills following their second reading in Parliament. Throughout the year, representatives of the Bar Association attended seminars and consultations including seminars on the proposed Sexual Offences Act and consultations in respect to the drafting of the proposed new employment legislation. The Bar Associations of the OECS member states and territories agree that the COVID quake affected all of us. The experience was hitherto unimaginable and the impact was forceful However, despite the tremendous challenges it brought, COVID-19 exposed the better angels of our nature. Lawyer 2020 was a year of extraordinary sharing, of easy access to endless opportunities for continuing legal education, and of embracing modern technology to maintain our sanity, sustain our livelihoods, and ensure that the administration of justice remained alive and well in our, in our respective jurisdictions. We welcome Lawyer 2021 with an indefatigable spirit and with confidence that whatever the circumstances, we shall never cease to carry out our responsibilities to our members, the judiciary and the public at large. I thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Paulette Harrigan. She comes to us from the island of Anguilla. Ms. Harrigan graduated from the Sir Hugh Wooding Law School and has been in private practice since 1987. Ms. Harrigan is a general practitioner and operates as a sole practitioner in her legal firm, Paulette Harrigan's Chambers in the Anguilla jurisdiction. Ms. Harrigan has been a member of the executive of the Anguilla Bar Association and has been an active participant in social issues affecting the island of Anguilla. Ms. Paulette Harrigan. May it please you, Madam Chief Justice, judges and masters, your excellencies, heads of state, the prime ministers, chief ministers, magistrates, registrars, members of the bar. I would like to adopt the protocol already established by my learned friends. As we start a new year, we have no idea what it will bring. Living in this beautiful part of the world, we are aware that we face the threat of potential devastation from hurricanes, earthquakes, 
chikungunya, dengue fever, and yet we meet the beginning of the year with optimism and enthusiasm for life. In this jurisdiction, we do not face the year with trepidation. Instead, we choose to embrace our circumstances by taking control over the things that are within our power and accepting those things which we cannot control and leaving those things in the hands of the Almighty God. Over the years, our court jurisdiction has faced so many challenges with natural disasters, financial constraints, storage to name but a few, and has adapted by using the latest technology to ensure that those people who choose to live and invest economically in this region have the legal services which are necessary to ensure that our communities remain safe and secure. It is as a result of the investment which has been made in the development and progression of our legal system that when the borders of our respective countries closed and we were placed in a lockdown situation due to COVID-19, that our jurisdiction was able to move seamlessly, or so it appeared, from a person-to-person -person legal system to a virtual one. When I state that the transition appeared to be seamless, I say that because I recognize that the response that our court had to COVID-19 is a result of the considerable hard work and planning of so many different people, not just now, but over the years. What it tells us is that our predecessors and those people who presently hold office chose wisely when they place their trust and confidence in all of the people who are responsible for the present status of our legal system. And I express it in those broad terms because it is like the movement of a luxury watch. Every spring, cog, screw, wheel is important to ensure that that watch works properly. And likewise, for our legal system, to be working as smoothly as it is, we have to recognize that from the genesis of an idea to its final execution, there have been so many people who have and are making a contribution. All I can do is commend everyone. The faces that we know and see and those that we do not know or see, they know their contribution. So what, as officers of the court, can we do in these troubling and uncertain times? Well, our primary responsibility is to provide legal services to the people in our community. If our legal systems in our communities cease operations, then our society will move towards anarchy. Regardless of COVID-19 and other potential disasters, people still need civil and criminal matters resolved. And when they cannot resolve their disputes, they place their trust and confidence in the legal system. It is that confidence that enables us to live in peace and harmony. Our legal system is the delicate thread that holds our communities together. We, of course, will have to adapt as we deem necessary based on our own circumstances in order to safeguard our staff, clients, colleagues, and ourselves. We may have to rely on each other to set up safe systems of operation. But at the end of the day, we must move forward without fear. We should use our best endeavors to ensure that our clients are not unnecessarily placed in close proximity to others and recognize that there is likely to be economic hardships which may affect our client's ability to take time off from work to attend court. We must respect our client's time, the time of the court, and the time of each other. We must also recognize that when clients invest their time and money in the legal system, they are looking for a timely resolution of their disputes. And as such, judgments should be delivered in a reasonable time because the court system is there for the people of our community. And when those people lose faith in the legal system, 
we all lose. I wish everyone a healthy and blessed new year. May it please the court. Mr. Thaddeus Mark Antoine was first called to the Bar of England and Wales at the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn and then the Bar of St. Lucia in 2000. He is the managing partner of the boutique corporate law firm of T.M. Antoine Partners. He holds a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of Wolverhampton and a Master's in Law from King's College, University of London in England. He specializes in corporate and commercial law. He is the immediate past president of the OECS Bar Association. To address us today on behalf of the Utter Bar of St. Lucia, I give you Mr. Thaddeus Antoine. May it please you, my Lord. My Lord, with your leave, I would like to adopt the protocol list to ably establish by your Lordship. However, with your further leave, I would like to recognize the Lunar Honorable Chief Justice, her leadership, Dame Janice Puerra, the judges and masters of our court, the excellencies, heads of state, the prime ministers and chief ministers of our respective OECS family, the magistrates and registrars of our court, and the presidents and members of our respective bars, indeed, the president of the OECS bar. My Lord, I am thankful for the opportunity to deliver some very brief remarks on behalf of the senior utter bar of the constituent bar of the OECS on the opening of the 2020-21 law year under the theme, the ECSC Managing the COVID Wake. My Lord, this is a novel moment in that for the first time, we are having the opening of the law year in January and indeed the full opening virtually. We are also at a point of inflection as the quake of COVID-19 has forced us or rather caused us to accelerate and adapt to what appears to be the new normal, living with COVID, the greatest health crisis the world has seen in 100 years. This is an extremely fast moving situation and the profession is facing unprecedented challenges. The pandemic raises questions that will reshape our future from issues of public health to privacy to elections and child welfare. The COVID-19 crisis is testing established systems and institutions that safeguard individual and our society. We have to record, reconsider the measures that we can take to ensure protections are upheld. But just as there are threats in any crisis, there are also opportunities, and we should also be considering how can we use this crisis as an opportunity to further strengthen our judicial system. The court has no doubt appeared to have or rather is adapting with ease. The leadership, foresight, and investment of our Lunar Chief Justice lay bare for all to see and indeed emulate. One may ask, was it fortuitous that we embarked on a project of taking the court fully online from GEMS to the e-litigation portal? I say no. It was vision and the acceptability of the available technology to solve some of the problems that the court would have experienced to the inconvenience of storms and hurricanes, traveling with the many heavy boxes of pleadings and evidence, the missing file phenomena, and the pure desire to have a modern functioning court system. After all, if we can get our governments to provide us with suitable brick and mortar halls of justices, we might as well get the best virtual online courtrooms possible. My Lord, the court appears to be struggling with attracting or retaining competent judicial officers. It may very well be that the compensation package is not attractive or that it is just not commensurate with the level of output required or indeed the conditions which the judges are required to work in are just not suitable. Year after year, the OECS bar has called on the governments of the OECS to make resources available for judicial clerks to assist the judges. A new judge starts off well with judgments. After a year or two on the bench, 
the delivery of judgments begins to slow down as it appears that is just too much to do. Attorneys general, ministers of justice, let's make the resources available to provide the much needed judicial clerks so as to ensure that judges are provided with the requisite support needed to ensure that the wheels of justice spin efficiently, thereby allowing backlogs and complaints from the public becoming a thing of the past. My Lord, while the rapid spread of COVID has not only affected our healthcare systems and has had disastrous secondary effects to our economic and social life, I can't overemphasize the tremendous opportunity that it has presented to the court. We have seen court hearings taking place over video link, mostly for chamber hearings and applications, which has kept the courts functioning and the wheels of justice turning. We have proven that video link is really reliable with the right internet connection. We, however, need to find an improved platform or management of video link, which would allow attorneys to have side conferences with their clients while on the video link. The ability to share documents on the screen for witnesses and the courts. We should also aim to not only use the technology for a judge per jurisdiction or territory, but explore creating a new type of judge. As, as I said before, we should be considering innovative ways to strengthen our judicial system. Whether we call a judge a circuit judge, an itinerant judge, or a specialist judge, what we need is a judge or judges, not assigned to one jurisdiction, but to all the jurisdictions, hearing specialized and sensitive matters, such as constitutional, administrative, election matters over video link. I submit this would help greatly in shielding our resident judges from the unfair attacks being generally peddled by politicians and their supporters. The fact is, we just do not have enough judges to constantly move around when the going gets tough, and so we have to find workable solutions. I submit our costs would be greatly improved if we have such specialist judges available to hear the urgent injunction, that urgent constitutional or defamation matter. However, in embracing the new technology, we should not abandon standards and traditions of the bar. We have seen a continued deterioration of the standards at the bar, most times in the face of the court. I submit that the court, along with the bar associations, have an equal responsibility in ensuring that counsel is keeping up to the standards and traditions of the bar, such as courtesy and respect for each other, courtesy and respect to the court, being fair to clients. A little reminder from the bench will help to remind practitioners that the court is a formal institution to deal with serious business in an efficient and timely manner. For if justice isn't considered serious business, we are in a lot of trouble. So that while we make use of technology to become more efficient in dealing with the work of the court and our clients, we must not at the same time lose sight of what we should really be doing, the practice of law ensuring that justice is done. My Lord, we have come a long way with COVID, and by all, all accounts, we still have a long way to go. While our courts have balanced the skills with the use of technology and kept our judiciary going, we as practitioners need to also balance our practices and personal lives to ensure that we maintain a strong and healthy body and mind. We need to get in some exercise and find ways to boost our immune systems so as to mitigate against COVID. The loss of life of any attorney is too much. Society needs us to maintain the rule of law, but our family also needs us to maintain a strong home. May it please the court. Our next speaker is Ms. Cora Galloway. Ms. Galloway is an attorney at law who has applied her trade in varying jurisdictions in both the private and public sectors for the past 15 years. Currently, she is engaged as a Crown Counsel within the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions in Montserrat. And to address us this morning, on behalf of the Utter Bar of the Emerald Isle, I give you Ms. Cora Galloway. Honorable Chief Justice, Judges and Masters, your Excellencies, 
heads of state, prime ministers, premiers and chief ministers, magistrates, registrars, members of the bar, good day. Rumbling vibrations of COVID-19 change the legal landscape and the frontiers of access to justice on Montserrat as a result of its sudden, brutal onslaught. The aftershock stimulated waves of change for the varying stakeholders involved in the promotion of justice. The Royal Montserrat Police Service, supported by the Royal Montserrat Defence Force, patrolled regularly to ensure compliance with curfew restrictions. Failure to comply meant a sure fine of $500 or three months imprisonment. Persons were arrested, charged, bailed and prosecuted by police prosecutors in the first instance. The Chief Magistrate, Ms. Vashti Sator, issued emergency measures to deal with sittings in the Magistrate's Court. Matters were adjourned to the following month, that being April, except for arrest matters. Counsel at the private and public bar were forced to overturn rudimentary practice of law as they knew it. Staff in the Attorney General's chambers and the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions worked from home. Private practitioners worked remotely. The inability to meet with clients made it difficult to take instructions, but simultaneously facilitated adaptation through the use and manipulation of various forms of media. The lawyer-client relationship was further exacerbated by the fact that some clients were unable to work and couldn't pay their legal fees. As the direction and duration of COVID-19 intensified, it became clear that further practical measures had to be taken. Liberation came in the form of the practice direction COVID-19 emergency measures and a notice issued under the hand of the Honorable Chief Justice Dame Janice Pereira, directing and declaring that the location from which a judge, master or registrar conducts a remote hearing would be a court for the purpose of conducting court proceedings. Aided by litigation training received, Practitioners embrace the cyber age COVID-19 thrust upon us by filing documents online. The High Court Registry remained open and so physical filing remained possible. Changes to curfew restrictions meant practitioners could meet with their clients face to face once again. In addition to teleconferencing and video conferencing, which were utilized during the lockdown period. New challenges of a reduced for workforce, a virtual workforce, and distance practicing to protect business operations was balanced against maintaining and following safety protocols. His Lordship Justice Ian Morley QC resumed sittings in the High Court via Zoom in May. Matters were called on and dealt with swiftly where it was possible to do so. In this new dispensation, access to reliable high-speed internet connection, a fully equipped courtroom, and most important of all, a technologically savvy attorney was a necessity. Poor connectivity issues impacted fluency of evidence, delays in communication frustrated advocates. Taking instructions from clients during hearings was futile. Lockdown was sudden with little to no time for preparation and planning. Yet, the legal system did not descend into chaos. The positive response by organizations, practitioners, the courts, and their staff must be commended. Honorable Chief Justice, members of the bench and registrars, on behalf of myself and my fellow colleagues at the bar, we say thank you for your creativity innovation and tenacity which ensured that access to justice remained a priority despite the seismic waves of COVID-19. I believe that brings us to the end of today's proceedings. All that remains is for me to thank the Honorable Chief Justice, the M. Janice Pereira, for her feature address and also to extend thanks to all who spoke this morning. We've had to embrace this technology to have this virtual opening in these especially challenging times. 
And so I give thanks to the agencies for public information and the government information services of each of the constituent member states and territories of the OECS, as well as the University of the West Indies, who have provided technical support to make today's virtual opening possible. I thank all who have attended this virtual opening of the Law Year 2021. Here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the COVID-19 pandemic still rages. In addition to that, we exist under an elevated level of alert in regards to the Sufria volcano. Despite these challenges, I wish all a safe Law Year 2021. Today's special sitting will now come to an end. <music>